invited, but actually pulled, drawn in, because he wants you. On the surface, you may think you're here tonight from duty, or habit, or curiosity, but those are not the real reasons. The real reason is that Christ himself has brought you here to live into the meal he has arranged and set, to knowing the food and drink, the bread and wine he himself gives to us. Tonight the Lord brings us close around his table as he brought his disciples to the upper room. Thirty-seven days ago of ordinary time, on Ash Wednesday, the imposition of ashes was done on our heads or on our wrists, and we have lived under the sign of ashes ever since. On this night, followers of Jesus began a solemn vigil of fasting and prayer until the day of Christ's resurrection is fulfilled. This is the night of love. On this night, Jesus took a towel and basin and washed his disciples' feet. On this night, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with his disciples for the last time. Will you please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship? A table was set before us. A feast was prepared for us. A meal of bread and wine, of meat and bitter herbs. The Lord calls us to this supper of remembrance. The Lord calls us to serve and to be served. Whenever we break the bread and share the cup, our understanding may fail us. But we will never forget Christ's example. We will never forget the full extent of his love. Let us reflect now on our common humanity. Tonight we begin the three great days of our Lord's passion, death, and resurrection the journey from the supper table to the cross, from the cross to the Easter dawn. We are followers on the way, exploring his truth, encountering his life. This is the night when Christ gave himself into the hands of those who would betray him, the night when he gathered with his disciples in the upper room. This is the night when our Lord took a towel and a basin and washed the disciples' feet, showing us how to honor and serve one another in love, and the night when he set the feast we celebrate with bread and cup, proclaiming his sacrifice until we meet at his eternal table. This is the night for watching and prayer. We give ourselves freely to the demands of these three days, confident that those who die in Christ will surely live with him. In this time of difficult separations and isolation, we turn to you, our living God, you who are our food and drink. Like our Lord Jesus in the wilderness, we will fast all of these 40 days. Like our Lord in the wilderness, we know from whence comes our food, our health, our salvation. We acknowledge that in our living, we only haltingly, often failingly give ourselves to trust in you, to love of our neighbors. We do not live as we ought. We do not pray as we ought. We pray for your continuing forgiveness, for your steadfast love, and for the transformation of our lives Jesus has begun to be complete in him. Come to us now. Be with us and stay with us. For any time without you is too long. Knit us together. Maintain in us the bonds of love, we pray, in Jesus' own name. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, by your word and spirit, you have given us a new commandment, to love and serve one another in Jesus' name. 
Let the good news of your liberating love, revealed in your word, be sealed in our hearts and shown in our lives through Jesus our Lord. Amen. This evening's Old Testament lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, 11 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Our Gospel reading is from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, the 1st through 17th verses, then 31b through 35. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Jesus, for as long as he walked the paths of Galilee, Samaria, and Judea, always made time and always created space for those who needed him who needed him for matters of life and death and sickness, who needed him for spiritual and moral guidance, who needed him for comfort and support, who needed him for salvation in this world and in the world to come. He stopped. He stayed. He listened and spoke. He felt and acted. He revealed life and welcomed people into it everywhere he went. He didn't expect people, even his closest friends, to fully understand why or how he did this. He was patient, even as he was endlessly hospitable. There was no, and there is not, an end to how he would extend himself for the sake of others. In a much lower key, I have a story to tell you. It's about two people who approached me last September, asking to be married here. I agreed to interview them because I need to know that I have hope for the success of any couple to be a couple who can thrive before I will marry. Now I will never share any details, but let it just be said that there were issues for both people and possibly issues between them. But nonetheless, I had exactly that hope. I sought and received the permission of session and scheduled the wedding in December of last year. That deadline and date passed with some okay reasons given, and we rescheduled the wedding. I said, okay. All that time, I kept asking them. And I asked them because I like to have this in my back pocket. I like to have this in my mind, whether or not I use it in the wedding service, though usually I do. I kept asking them to tell me that one story, the story inside of which they knew. They knew they were for each other. They knew about their future. They knew about their love. And these two people knew which story that was, the North Carolina story. But they never did tell it to me. As the second date for their wedding approached, and that date was only three weeks ago last Saturday, I kept attempting to reach them by email and text and phone call, and all to no avail. Those who knew what was going on grew impatient with me and dismissive of them. I did finally and unilaterally call it off one week ahead of time. But I have to be honest with you. If they came down here and came into my office, and if they satisfactorily explained all this non-communication, and if they told me that story, I would schedule them again, and I would marry them. Jesus is like that with us. He simply waits, waits patiently, waits longer than we deserve. In fact, he waits forever simply holding the door open, holding our room ready. 
And you remember that in this section of John, Jesus tells that story on himself at the beginning of the 14th chapter. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And so Jesus behaves as the very best of guides in that ancient Near Eastern world, showing people around by going everywhere first, making sure every tiny detail is perfect, then coming all the way back, collecting them and making the same walk twice to bring them to the place that he has prepared for them. Jesus makes that place ready for us so that we will be at home with our every need met. And if that weren't true, as we have come to trust him, why would he tell us that? I hope tonight or tomorrow or sometime you will give Jesus' farewell discourse to his disciples, which is this whole section of the Gospel of John from the 13th chapter through the 17th chapter. I hope you'll give it the time it deserves. Its spiritual resources are inexhaustible. Most of you know that I myself was married once before and that that did not end well. Did the person who presided over my wedding fail? No. Did God who blessed that wedding fail? No. God and that person saw enough hope, enough readiness, enough energy to believe that two persons could step away from their failures, embrace the future, and build a better life. They both, God and that person, simply and deeply, deeply believed in life, believed in potential, believed in the seed of the Spirit deep within the two people in front of them. Did God and that person fail? No. I failed. And in that failure, you have heard me say, I gave up on life. It was Jesus, in whom I had failed to believe, who came to me and said, No, you're not through. You're just unfinished. He held open the door to my next room and convinced me to go through. Friends, there was hope beyond hope for me. There is for all of us. Because the truth is, like the disciples, we all fail. Somewhere. Sometime. And Jesus says, as he stares death in the face, Don't worry. There's still time. After I'm gone, I'll send the Spirit. That is the Jesus who then goes out to face all that is to come. And he again is so patient with soldiers and guards, with Annas and Caiaphas, even with Pilate, to whom he says, Really, you have no power. And I think he implies in his best Mr. Rogers voice, And that's all right. And even as these people close their minds and close their hearts and close their fists, all the way to the very end, Jesus still hopes. He sees those closed minds, those closed spirits, those closed fists about to be used as the hard outer shells of seeds. And his gentle thought is, here. Let me help. Jesus sees their possibility, not their failure, their latency, and not their lifelessness. And he reaches out to help and to save in his worst hour just as he always did, just as he always does, and just as he always will. 
Jesus tells the story of ourselves, the one we still haven't told. He tells it with his same patient hospitality. Thanks be to God. Will you please stand as you are able and join me in our affirmation of faith. Christ Jesus, although he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Friends, we have spent a lot of time considering our concerns and joys. I will summarize them as our difficulties, our anxieties, our fears in this lonely time, but also our love and our reaching out and our serving each other. In that vein, I'm happy to bring you news from Bob and Elaine Jackson up in New Holland, Pennsylvania. They are doing well, even though three persons in their enormous assisted living facility have died, and there are 12 who are infected. They themselves are in quarantine because she had to go to the doctor and he had to take her. But they are well and they send their greetings and assert their love for this congregation above any other. Friends, as we ourselves assert our love for this congregation above any other by the ways in which we attempt to serve and attempt to stay in contact, I encourage you in each and every one. I encourage you to care. I encourage you to love. I encourage you to see latency and potential and not lack of life and isolation. Just as we are exploring this electronic world, so explore this world of loneliness, what it means for us when we dive into it, what it means when we pull others out of it. Will you please join me in the prayers of the people which are in litany form? One in heart, one in mind, one in you, Holy Spirit, we pray for the church and for the world that we may proclaim the gospel boldly. Hear us, Lord that healing may come for people who are sick and peoples who are torn and weary. Hear us, Lord. That many dead and left for dead may be raised and death itself vanquished. Hear us, Lord. That all who suffer symptoms may become symptom-free by your grace. Hear us, Lord. That all who are possessed, oppressed, distressed, depressed, and downcast may be set free at last. Hear us, Lord. That we may love one another and all your creation as you have loved us. Hear us, Lord. Amen. Now let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We thank you all for your offerings during the week. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Generous God, in this time when, socially isolated, we may be focused only on what we do not have. 
Remind us, O God, of what we do have. Remind us as well that what we have, we have for the sake of our neighbor, that we have it for the sake of all. Strengthen us to gladly part with what we do have, and so to participate in your coming kingdom, building up your great shalom. Amen. Friends, you get to join in the charge as well. Merciful Savior, we have traveled this long, dusty Lenten journey. We feel alone. Our feet are tired, dirty, aching, and calloused. You have shown us your love by becoming a humble servant. Humble us when we try to travel without you. As Christ has washed us, so let us wash one another. Humble us when we believe some work is below us. As Christ has washed us, so let us wash one another. Humble us when we are too proud to accept help or care or love. As Christ has washed us, so let us wash one another. Humble us when we do not fully receive the gift of your amazing and bountiful grace. As Christ has washed us, so let us wash one another. Amen. Friends, I am going to ask you now to remain still and seated and with us there at home until those of us stripping the sanctuary have finished and have exited and it is dark. There are no dances for dark days. There is no music to minimize the pain. The best we can do is to remain still and silent and to try to remember the face of God and how to kneel and how to pray. 